Everybody, welcome back to Silver and Black today, uh, Odyssey Sports Original Podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. Do us a favor if you don't already subscribe to the show, wherever you get your audio, you can find Silver and Black today. We appreciate the subscription there. Also, if you're watching us on YouTube, hit the subscribe and the notifications bell and join us there in the live chat as we have every show. Good stuff. So we appreciate that as well. Scott Branson, Mo Moten with you. Mo is the senior NFL writer over at Bleacher Report and also Raiders column. Com. You can follow him on x.com at Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. You can also read my stuff up on Sports Not as well. And you can follow me on the X at LV Gully. And the show is SNB today. All right. We got the whole Raiders schedule now. We're going to go over it here. We waited a day because everybody was doing lives and all that stuff. And Mo had his last night. If you missed it, shame on you. You would have a heads up on what we're going to talk about on the show today. But Everybody's been talking about the schedule. The Raiders schedules come out. It's important for people, not only for those in Raider Nation, so many people travel, Mo. They want to go see their team uh, on the road, some of these good road trips they have coming up. But also, if for the team itself and for us covering the team, it gives us a sense for tough parts of the schedule, uh, lighter parts of the schedule. Look, it's professional football. All the games are tough. But at the same time, uh, you were looking for late season games and cold weather, all that kind of stuff that West Coast teams tend to uh, stumble in. So uh, when we look at the schedule, Mo, and I'm going to pop it up on the screen here for folks in just a second. But uh, what was your initial reaction and sort of your 50,000 foot level on how it shook out for the Raiders uh, with the schedule in 2024? What stood out to me initially is that the NFL doesn't think the Raiders are going to do very well this year. <laughs> two prime, two prime time games later in the season, one against the Chiefs, which I expected after what the Raiders did to the Chiefs in Kansas City last year on Christmas. So I expected that uh, they play on Black Friday, and then they have a Monday Night Football game against the Atlanta Falcons, which I thought was weird if they given them the Monday Night Football against the Falcons and not the Saints. Yeah. I don't, I don't get the appeal. I mean, Kirk Cousins and and Obviously, the league thinks the Falcons are going to be pretty good, but I thought that the Saints would be the better play here on Monday Night Football against the Raiders. And the Saints and the and the Raiders are on at 1, 1 p.m. in Week 17. Yeah. So the league is not buying into the Derek Carr revenge narrative at all. Like There is no interest from in the league about showcasing Derek Carr against his former team. You're putting not only you're not putting it on primetime, it's on at 1 p.m. I get it's in New Orleans, so it will be on at 1 p.m. But 1 p.m. in week 17, I mean, there's no guarantee both of these teams are going to be competing for a playoff spot <laughs> at that point in the season. Even if you're optimistic about the Raiders, I feel like the Saints, and I put out my Bleacher Report win-loss projections, I think the Saints are going to finish 7-10 and 10 this year. Yeah. So if, they, if my predictions are right, the Saints may not even be vying for the division title at that point. So... You lose the appeal of teams vying for playoff contention at that point in the season if they fall out of the picture early, and then you put it on at one o'clock. That that really surprised me. Yeah, it did. And then I, I wasn't surprised with the Charger opening. Uh, it seems like they've done that a few few over the past few years. I mean, inter inter division rivals uh, to open up the season, of course, mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. Jim Harbaugh's first game there, and then they have to go to Baltimore. So uh, you know that's that's good. To get to the fact that they have Baltimore on the road in September, much better than Baltimore on the road in December or January. So you got to like that. Still a tough game, obviously, with that team there. But that I, I overall looked at it though, and you're right. The 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 the, the lack of prime time games. I, I actually quickly picked up on that and 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 put a post up about it. And I had people kind of firing back at me. Who cares? I'm like, okay, well, your feelings are hurt. I get it, but. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, the NFL is going to target. Listen, the, the Raiders have had their share of games over the last three years in prime time. Um, and some of them have been good. Some of them have not been good. But I also go back to the point, and I know we'll get into this a couple different times as we talk through the schedule and we talk in the second segment 
By the way, we're going to get Mo's um, win-loss projections. And then in the third, we'll get your calls. But uh, is the fact that uh, star power, right? Now, the Raiders have it on defense with Max Crosby, and they have t uh, Tay Adams, all that stuff, okay? But uh, they don't have a quarterback that is a big name. Now, Gardner Minshew has a little bit of appeal to him, but he's not a first-line franchise quarterback, if you look at some of these games, yes, the Jets have what, like six primetime games or whatever it is because of Aaron Rodgers, not because the Jets. Now, everybody expects the Jets. It's New York. You get it. But, Mo, that star power thing matters. And I know Raider fans aren't going to be happy with you and I bringing a little bit of dose of reality to the excitement they have over this team, which is great. Uh, but that's sort of that that indication. And I know a lot of fans are like, hey, I don't care. Just win or lose. Win, win games. Don't lose games. I don't care if they're on national TV or not. There are two uh there are two thoughts here. And from the fan side, you don't care about I mean, I think I think most fans don't really care about how many primetime games the Raiders have as long as they win football games. Yeah. I, I get the sense of that. And and you know, I, I understand that train of thought. But if you're looking at it and you're asking why why do the Raiders only have two primetime games, and I, I wrote this on Sports Not. I had the over under four and a half primetime games. And I said, it's definitely going to be under because the Raiders don't have the star quality at the quarterback position. Again, I know fans mm -hmm. don't care about having a star quarterback or not. They just want to win football games. Right. But again, if you're asking the question, why did the Raiders only get two primetime games? That's your reason why it's a quarterback centric league. Yes. Devontae Adams and Max Crosby are stars, but when you don't even know who your starting quarterback is going to be for week one, and it could possibly be a, a a quarterback who's going to his second year that a lot of people, the casual NFL fan is not familiar with. They're not going to put that team on national TV more than twice, three times, simply because the appeal just isn't there for that quarterback. Now, if the Raiders had drafted Michael Penix, I guarantee you, he, they probably would have got another prime guy, prime mm -hmm. time game or two, but you're choosing between a second year quarterback who has fewer than 16 starts and Garner Minshew, who's bounced around the league and been, you know, a low end starter, fill in, you know, a backup, you're just not going to get put on the national stage that many times. Right. And, and that's the thing people need to realize. And I know people don't care because they're Raiders fans and they want their team to win, to your point. I'm just I'm just ex explaining like you are, too, from a television perspective, from an entertainment value perspective. Right. You're right. Because, listen, love Aiden O'Connell as a kid, good quarterback. I think he'll do well but he's not sexy. Don't expect him to be. Like you said, if he wins games, I don't care uh, if he says nothing to anybody, but it is what it is. He's a good guy. He's a good young man and, and all of that, but he's not a great story. Gardner Minshew's kitsch is kind of over, right? I mean, it's good for Raider fans. His personality fits right in, but that story of Gardner Minshew and all the crazy dress and the haircuts and the mustache and all that stuff, that was three years ago. Okay. So, so you understand it, but Back to the schedule, Mo, and I'm going to flash the schedule back up here because this, this is what stuck out to me, and I want to see if you agree with me on this one, which is I look at the schedule overall and I say, you know what? This is uh, this is pretty vanilla, man. I think uh, Jason Fitz is – uh, you got to give him full credit for that for that term on this because as far as schedules go – now, they still have this, the seventh toughest schedule based on the win per winning percentage of the teams they're playing. Okay, so I'll, I'll put that out there. But if you look at how the schedule and the dates and the road trips stack up, uh, pretty pretty straightforward and vanilla. I do think the toughest stretch for them, they got very lucky here, but the toughest stretch for them to me is weeks 8 through 11, and they have a bye in week 10. So they have to go or they have to host Kansas City on October 27th. Then I'll see you guys all here for our party with Murph and those guys in Cincinnati on November 3rd. In week nine, so you get the Chiefs, the Bengals in consecutive weeks. Then you get the bye, and then you have to go to Miami again, okay? And then you're home against the Broncos, Chiefs, and then you go back on the road uh, for the Buccaneers. So, so you look at that eight through eleven, and then really eight through thirteen, it gets tougher. I know the Broncos. I, I don't have a lot of faith that the Broncos will be great, so not as worried about that. But you have the Chiefs there. Um, within two times within five weeks, and you got to buy. But to me, that is that is the meat of the schedule where, you know, Mo, I think that uh, that's going to be a tough stretch for them to go through that because of the consecutive games against Kansas City, Burrow. Then you got to go to Miami after the buy, and then you face the Chiefs two weeks after that again. 
I agree with you there. I, I would think, though, that week six through 15 to me is is the season. I know that's a long no block. That's like a 10 week stretch. But look through. Look at if you put the, the uh, schedule back up, if you look at week six through 15, with the exception of the Broncos and the bye week, there are there are some tough games here. I even oh, say, yes. you know, it starts with the Steelers because I understand Russell Wilson couldn't beat the Raiders with the Denver Broncos, but he's playing with a better roster in Pittsburgh. I think Pittsburgh is going to be good this year, and the Raiders have struggled with Pittsburgh over the last couple of years. Now, those were in prime time, and this isn't. But the Raiders have been able to beat Pittsburgh in the last couple of years. Now, I know that, you know people say, well, that's Josh McDaniels. We'll see if that changes anything with Antonio Pierce. But look at after Pittsburgh. You got the Rams who made the playoffs last season. And at, as Vinny Vassignor <laughs> pointed out at the at the at the um, Las Vegas Review Journal, the Raiders are one in four at SoFi Stadium yeah. since that stadium has opened, right? And then you, if you keep looking at the schedule, you got the Chiefs, which is going to be tough because you know they're going to remember what the Raiders did to them on Christmas, so they're going to be looking at revenge. The Bengals and Joe Burrow should be a playoff team. The Dolphins were a playoff team last year. I said the Broncos were re- rebuilding. They get the Chiefs again in their home on Black Friday. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Falcons. A lot of Raider fans are underestimating the NFC South because it isn't a strong division. But the Buccaneers were a playoff team last year with Baker Mayfield. They do have Chris Godwin and Mike Evans there. They do have a veteran defensive play caller and Todd Bowles, who's also the head coach, who can cause some problems for Aiden O'Connell or Garner Minshew. Yep. And the Falcons, I expect the Falcons to win the NFC South with Kirk Cousins on Monday Night Football. So, again, that week. Six to week 15 stretch, that big block in the middle of the schedule, to me, that's a tough stretch for the Rays, and that's why they have oh. the seventh hardest schedule in the league. Yes, exactly, and and that's it. I it, My focus was more on the road games and what they have to do, but also you're right. I mean, you look at the schedule outside, okay, the Chargers, I'm still going to give the, the Raiders the edge, and we'll get to the win-loss uh, next because because even when you, when you talked about it yesterday on your live, and your record, which we'll unveil in the next segment, uh, I was there with you because I, I was right there with you. And in, in, in some cases, as I ran through it, even even reduced it by a game as far as the win column goes. But you look at that, and it's going to be really important for this team, I think, to start out uh, strong, Mo, because one, weeks one through five, you have, of course, you have the Chargers in L.A., you have the Ravens in Baltimore, and then you get Cleveland, good team. We'll see what happens at quarterback for Cleveland. Denver and then Pittsburgh uh, in in week six, so it it it's tough. So I think that they're going to have to start very strong there. Um, I look at this too. They did escape, like I said, the cold weather games at the end of the year um, as they travel only east uh, in week seventeen to take on the Saints, which is in the dome. But they have to go to Tampa and Miami within four weeks of each other with the Chiefs uh, 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 in between that as well. So uh, not easy stuff, and I think that if you look at how the schedule worked out for them, um, you can't control the teams you're going to play, but the dates obviously I think were favorable. Getting the Week 10 by I think is good, especially with, like you said, that stretch of games there. Um, but uh, again, I think it's going to be vital that this team start as well as they can. They can't afford – to start off by losing some of these games where they should be like Carolina, like the Chargers, like the Broncos. Those are games they're going to have to have. Right. And we'll get into the win loss stuff in a minute, but there are games here where if the Raiders play certain teams at the beginning of the year, I'd like the matchup. So yeah. like I just said, a lot of people are underestimating the Falcons this year because they, they botched their first round of, of the draft, draft of Michael Penix. But I expect the Falcons to be pretty good. If the Raiders were playing the Falcons early in the season, I would have preferred that simply because Kirk Cousins is getting used to a new offense. They mm-hmm. have a new coaching staff. By week 15, they should be settled in at that time. And, and if they're a good team, we'll know already at that point in, in the season. I like the Raiders playing the Chargers just uh, in the first week simply because same concept here where you have a new coaching staff. Herbert's been there, of course, but he's going to be getting used to new things, and there are going to be interesting interesting things going on with the offensive line. Remember, the Chargers are starting Joel all at right tackle. who's a left tackle on the collegiate level, so he's going to have to get used to playing on the other side of the line in addition to Herbert getting used to his offense, in addition to the coach staff getting used to their players. So I think the Raiders have an advantage yet because they have the continuity and Antonio Pierce. Now they have a new offensive coach staff, but they have more continuity than the Chargers have 
going into week one. So I like the matchup of having the Chargers week one because I think the Raiders have a bit of an edge, even though the Chargers are favored by field goal, which is which means it goes either way because the Chargers are the home team, so they get the customary three points. So basically they're even. Yeah. But the Raiders should I don't say should win that game. I would I if I were picking today, I, I would pick the Raiders. But you're right. They have to start off strong, and I do have them starting off pretty well. It's at the back end of the schedule I have them struggling. Yeah, and, and we're going to get, obviously, into the win-loss here in a second. But, you know, I look at those first two games, Mo, and, and we'll talk about it more. But those first two games, you know, Chargers, like you said, I think they have an edge. If they can go to Baltimore and somehow come – that could be a that could be a, a, a table setter for them and a season I think tone setter if they can go to Baltimore be very very tough but we're gonna find out here in just a second what Mo's projected record this is of course before camp so it could change depending what happens between now and then but we're doing this based on the schedule so we're gonna take a quick break we come back we're gonna get to that and then we're gonna get to your calls here and we're gonna get it all for you done within an hour so that you can listen to us on your commute way home today our show's out a little late here on this thursday because we wanted to wait for this uh but we will get back to you and talk about the raiders in 2024 what does most Stradamus think yes the crystal ball is coming out right after the break this is scott this is mo this is silver and black today don't go anywhere fun welcome back it is silver and black today we're reviewing the raiders schedule we are an odyssey sports original podcast covering the raiders please subscribe to the show wherever you get your audio if you're watching us on youtube hit that subscribe and the notifications bell and uh, take part in the chat have fun with us here we appreciate it mo moton scockle branson back with you and we're going to get into one of my favorite times of the year when mo's alter ego no not midtown to mo no 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 not morbid mo no no Right. Some people but, when we say it more than like, based on what I'm going to say. <laughs> uh oh, you just tipped it off. <laughs> but uh, he's going to put out the crystal ball. He's going to become most redomus. If you missed his Bleacher Report live yesterday on Wednesday after the schedule release, that's okay because he'll he'll kind of cover it here in a much more condensed format. But we're going to get Mo's projection on the Raiders and their record in 2024. One warning. You know, sometimes they're going to show you something that could cause you to feel uncomfortable on television because it's some video. Well, Raider Nation, if you have your rose-colored glasses on, this may offend you and you might not be very happy. Maybe. We'll see what Mo has to say. But anyway, we're going to get into that schedule here. Mo, when you look at this, you talked about it last segment about the difficulties with this seventh-hardest schedule in the NFL, that stretch between weeks 8 and 15. Uh, very, very difficult. Some good teams there, including the Chiefs, two times within five weeks. Sandwich with the Bengals, Steelers, Ram, uh, you know, it's been tough. But anyway, give us, lay it out for us and and what you think here on the Raiders schedule. I'll put it up on the screen so people can see it that are watching us. If you're listening to us, Mo will, with his velvety voice, give you all the information <laughs> you need. Go ahead, Mo. So I have the Raiders, as I said at the end of the first segment, starting off well. I believe I have them starting off four and two. So that first part of the season portion of the season i have the Raiders starting off pretty well someone in the bleach report live mentioned just like the john gruden years right and i said right you know i like john like the john gruden raider years the raiders are going to start off the season strong and i think as we talked about i think they're gonna they're gonna take advantage of some of the games that they might even be favored in early the carolina panthers the Denver broncos i don't think the cleveland browns are going to be that good i think the cleveland browns are going to pull back if deshaun watson has not been playing well so that's a game i also think they win now, while they could upset the Ravens, it's a tough sell for me simply because the Ravens are a perennial playoff contender. Now, the, Ra the Raiders have beaten the Ravens recently, so I'm not saying mm -hmm. they can't upset the Ravens, but I just think it's a tough go on back-to-back -to -back, um, road games against, again, a, a, not only just a playoff contender, but a Super Bowl contender. Now, the Steelers, as I said in the first segment, will be tough. So, 4-2 and two start, losing to, the two a losing to two AFC North teams in the Ravens and Steelers. Mm. That middle block that I talked about from weeks six to fifteen is when I where I have the Raiders slipping up a bit. So I have a three game losing streak in there. I believe it's um to the Chiefs, Buccaneers, Falcons. And now a lot of Raider fans are going to disagree with me on that one, but I'm I'm going to tell you again, <laughs> the NFC South division is going to be very tricky at the end of the year because I think those are the two teams, Tampa Bay and the Falcons, that are going to be competing. For a division crown. Not to say the Raiders won't be competing for a wild card spot, 
But don't overlook those two teams just because it's a weak division. Mm-hmm. Now, I ended up with the Raiders going 8-9. and nine. And I know what a lot of fans are going to say. We were 8-9 and nine last year. How are we still 8-9 in 2024 with Christian Wilkins, with Antonio Pierce coming back and having some continuity, you know, with some of the young pieces we have? How are we still 8-9? and nine? We improved during the offseason. And I say this, this is a PSA every year, every offseason I say this. The Raiders aren't the only team that make that makes roster changes during the offseason. All 32 teams are drafting players, signing players, trading for players, right? The other thing is you're not playing last year's schedule. So I think this year's schedule, as pres- as it is presently, because we don't, you know, there are injuries that are going to happen, of course, but assuming, let's say, everyone is healthy on that schedule. Mm-hmm. The Raiders have a tougher schedule, in my opinion, this year than they had last year. So remember the wins that I talked about, Scott, last year the Raiders had against backup quarterbacks with the exception of Patrick Mahomes? Yeah. I'm not going to predict that they're going to play, you know, four or five backup quarterbacks at the end, end of the season as they did last year. Remember the games that they won last year, again, against quarterbacks who are either backups or not starters in this league, with the exception of Patrick Mahomes, right? So I – it gives me a feeling of, do you remember the 2021 season when the Raiders went on a streak at the end of the year to get to the playoffs and they played you know, a string of backup quarterbacks to get there? The COVID now, year, I yeah. give, now, you give the Raiders credit for winning those games because, you know, backup quarterbacks can still beat you. We see it all the time. The Raiders struggled with, with Nick Mullins <laughs> last year, and, and I forgot who else, who they put in. It was in the Minnesota Vikings game. It was Nick Mullins and Joshua Dobbs. So, Josh Mayfield, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not downplaying that backup quarterbacks can beat you, but what are the chances that the Raiders play a string of backup quarterbacks again? So I'm thinking back to 2021 where a lot of a lot of us were high on the Raiders after going to the playoffs and we're thinking, okay, they should be able to build off of that, even though they they you know they beat lesser competition at the quarterback position. <clears throat> and then they take a step back the following year under Josh McDaniels. I'm not saying they take a step back under Antonio Pierce compared to that year under Josh McDaniels. But let's put it into context. We talked about this last week, I believe. When the Raiders had to play borderline playoff teams or playoff teams last year, they struggled, with the exception of the Chiefs. Now, as presently as it is presently without the injuries, we know things happen, but without the injuries, if you're looking at the schedule, not a lot of uh, backup caliber, below average quarterbacks on that schedule again between weeks six and 15 and even at the end of the season so my concern is but the Raiders quarterback position is it good enough to get the Raiders over the hump into the playoffs with 10 wins I have questions about that and I have questions about Luke Getze (coughs) again Luke Getze hasn't developed a young quarterback yet doesn't mean he can't do it but he hasn't shown he can do it yet and that's the other part of my concern about the Raiders on a big scale quarterback and their offensive coordinator offensive play caller and Luke Getze so that's why I have the Raiders at eight nine not that they didn't improve and it won't show on the field right but that the competition level for them is going to get a lot harder and it's going to be a lot harder for them to beat playoff caliber teams with their quarterback and if their offensive coordinator doesn't show he could develop a quarterback you know a, a young quarterback or take a average to spot starter and make him a franchise looking type signal caller Exactly. Now, could that happen? I'm doubtful, but but let's say it does. Okay, then we're having a different conversation. But I think you hit on something here, too, because Raider Nation should feel good about their team getting better. Um, I like what they did in the draft in several different ways. And and so in no way, and I know you're not doing this because we always try to keep it real here. You guys don't have to agree. Totally fine with that. But I, I look at the situation. I go back to the quarterback position. I look at this team's that you're facing. And I know people are going to say Justin Herbert sucks. He doesn't, but do they beat the chargers? I think so. But then think about the quarterbacks. Look at the differences with some of these teams. Some of these teams, the Raiders might be on par with from talent levels on certain um, uh, angles of the game, but you give them the edge because of the quarterback. I mean, you look at Lamar now their defense too. the Raiders defense. A lot of Raider fans think they're going to be able to make it to the playoffs just because their defense is good. The offense doesn't have to do as much. Not necessarily so. I think you still have to make plays. You still have to have playmakers. But you look at that stretch from week seven, even with the Rams. Then you got Mahomes. Then you got Burrow. Then you got Tua. Okay, maybe some of you guys don't think Tua is that good. He's still very good. Then you get the Broncos. 
And then that stretch to your point, and I'm right there with you with eight wins. I could even see I'm a little more, I'm a less, I'm less skeptical on Cleveland, by the way, depending on what happens at quarterback. So I could see that being a tough game as well, but I do think they win it. So I have them at eight wins too, Mo. And I think weeks 13, Mahomes, then Mayfield on the 14th on the road. Then you talked about Kirk Cousins, then Trevor Lawrence. If Trevor Lawrence has a good year, I know he's kind of in a prove-it year this year, right? He hasn't lived up to some of the expectations. A lot of pressure on him. We'll see what that's towards the end of the season. And then Derek Carr, not so worried about that. And then you close out with the Chargers. So I look at that situation and I think no matter how good the Raiders' defense is, um, you can have a very good defense. You can stop Patrick Mahomes like they did on Christmas Day. Um, but having to do that nine or ten times during the season is tough if your offense isn't doing it. So it's all going to come down to Luke Getze. I agree with you 100%. And the quarterback position. They have weapons on offense. The offensive line, I think, will be better than it has been, and it wasn't terrible if, if, in the first place. So you look at that, and you can say, yeah, eight and nine, could they somehow win two more games, depending how the rest of the teams fare out, everything you can't predict right now? Sure. But does 10 games get you in the NFL? I don't see the Raiders winning 11 or 12 games in, un, in, in under, any circumstance. So from that perspective, getting you to 10 wins might get you in, depending. Um, but but I think that being in that 8 to 10 win range, depending on and what we see coming up here at camp and in the preseason, I think it's where it's at. Um, I know people want to have a better view than that. They want to get the playoffs. But uh, just telling you like it is, I think you're going to see people pick the Raiders with less wins than that. Uh, but I do think that that eight win is doable and should be. I can't imagine them winning or, excuse me, losing more than nine games, Mo. I think that would be a disaster. I think the team would be going backwards if that happened, and I don't think they do. So, Scott, I'll read you the, the names of the quarterbacks that the Raiders beat under Antonio Pierce because Joshua Daniels is awful, so we won't you know, we'll discount that. But Antonio Pierce, while I do feel good about him as a head coach, uh -huh. I've I've seen some of the best head coaches struggle without figuring out the quarterback position. And I don't think Antonio Pierce is going to be any different. But I'll read you the quarterback names of the teams that the Raiders beat with Antonio Pierce as a head coach. They beat the New York Giants, Tommy DeVito, right? He start, he played most of the snaps at quarterback there with the Giants. Jets, Zach Wilson. Chargers, at the time it was uh, – East, uh, East and Stick. East and Stick, right? Because the, the team had fallen apart. That was a 63 burger game, right? Right. Kansas City, give them credit for that. It was Patrick Mahomes, no doubt. I can't take that away from the Raiders. Denver Broncos, Jared Stidham. I read to you one quarterback that is a starter for this season that the Raiders beat last year under Antonio Pierce. One. The rest of those guys are either backups or competing for jobs. And as I said, if you're looking at a completely healthy schedule, completely healthy schedule, because we're not predicting injuries here. No, right? we can't. We don't want to either. Exactly. So you're you're looking at a tougher slate. The chances of the Raiders playing, you know, a, you know, a string of backup quarterbacks like that at the at the end of the season, you know, is is a you know, it's tough to predict that. And if you're right. saying, okay, the starters are going to be healthy, Baker Mayfield's going to be healthy, Kirk Cousins is going to be healthy, Justin Herbert's going to be healthy. You know, it's going to be a tougher slate for the Raiders. And that's why I don't have them winning, you know, double digit games or 11 and 12 games like some of the optimistic fans out there, which is fine. If you're if you disagree, I'm OK with that. I've been doing this for 10 years. I've I've predicted worse for the Raiders in some years and people have have said some of the worst things to me. And that's fine. I understand it's May and and, and every fan base is full of hope. I said Correct. to you, Scott, a couple of weeks ago, every team is going to the playoffs and every team is slept on in May. Yes. So we figure out how the chips fall from September to January. We'll see. But I put my I put my projections out there. I'm not saying I'm 100 percent right. This is just my thought and why. And I did. Again, I want to make this clear, Scott. I do give the greatest credit for improving their roster. Christian Wilkins will make a difference. But in this league, you have to have a quarterback who's going to get you some wins. We saw that last year when the Raiders defense played well against the Minnesota Vikings. That game was three to zero. The defense right. did all it could, but they couldn't score any points. Now, I don't think the offense would be that bad this year, should be able to score, you know, 22, 23, 24 points. But still, when you compare the quarterback position in the offense, I know they have the playmakers, the Raiders, but does Luke Getzey have the creativity to get the ball to those playmakers? Can Aiden O'Connell improve during all season enough to get the Raiders over the hump? Is Garner Minshew going to be as good under Luke Getzey as he was under Shane Steichen? 
I have my doubts about that. Yep. And it's also uh, a situation where, I mean, you talked about the Chiefs game, a huge win. I know how much it means to Raider Nation. It was a great Christmas gift, uh, a gutsy defensive win for the Raiders. Remember, in that game, Aiden O'Connell, 9 of 21 for 62 yards. So you know, imagine having, if, if you have that kind of performance in big games against these other big quarterbacks, it's not going to end up that way. You're not going to be able to win every game on defense. You just can't. So you're right. The Luke Getzey thing. And remember last year, talking about projection, people get angry. Some people will not tune into our show again because they think they're going to win 13 games. Hey, we're going to tell it like it is. Uh, if you don't like it, you can argue with us. That's cool. I have no problem with that. Like you said, Mo, but um, I, I don't, the schedule gets tougher. All the teams got better. The Broncos and Chargers from a talent perspective, have they fallen back behind the Raiders in some ways? Maybe, but uh, the Chargers have a quarterback. You guys might not like him and think he's overrated. And I think the Chargers get overrated every year. And it looks like they're getting overrated again this year because during the schedule shows on TV, I had people just gushing about the Chargers and how they're going to do it. I, I don't think they will. But that goes with the Jim Harbaugh effect plus the Herbert effect. You have your franchise quarterback. Whether or not he's able to win anything, we'll see. But I do think that you look at this situation and you want the team to get better. Sometimes that's indicative by win-loss record. You also have, remember, factoring into this too, not only the Getzy question, to your point, Mo, and 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 I'm with you on, on Antonio Pierce. I want him to do well. It's obviously better for anybody, even if you're just in this business, because you want to see a good story. You want to see a guy do well, and you want to see Raider fans, our listeners, by the way, are happy. But he's a rookie head coach. I know he had the games last year, but it's a little bit different now. You got the reins, you making all the calls, it's all you. So there's going to be uh, there's going to be a different feel there, and he's going to have to learn his way there too. Luckily, he's got some good veterans on his staff there as well. Mo, anything else on this? I mean, do you see anything happening this team where where it could get really rough and they go below those eight wins? I mean, is there anything? I mean, not factoring injuries like you said, but. Um, does this have the possibility, like I said, I could see them winning 10 games, high ceiling, uh, but from a, from a floor perspective, do you see anything there? From a floor perspective, I I wouldn't go lower than seven wins. Yeah. Remember, the, the odds makers over under for the Raiders win total is six and a half. So I think I, I would strongly take the over on the Raiders you know, win-loss record. I think they win at least seven games. I mean, if of all the games that they could possibly lose that I have them winning, if I'm looking at the schedule right now, I'm, I mean, if Trevor Lawrence bounces back, now they collapsed. Jaguars collapsed at the end of last year. They did. But if Trevor Lawrence bounces back, that could be a game that the Raiders drop. I don't see that happening because I, I have, you know, I have questions about the Jaguars offense, but they do have a Super Bowl winning head coach, Doug Peterson. You never know. Uh, do the Broncos finally break their losing streak to the Raiders and split with the Raiders? You know, we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens there. Anything can happen any given Sunday, right? But I'm I'm kind of like you. And, I, again, I'm not trying to be overly critical here, but I don't think the Raiders are a bad team. I just no. think that – I just think that my expectations are a little lower than the average fan where I see a lot of Raider fans saying double digit wins. And I just don't think they're there yet until they figure out the quarterback position. If we're going to go on the positive side, I do think the Raiders are going to go four and two in the AFC West within their division. So I do think the Raiders are going to split with the chiefs. And I do think they split with the chargers. I think the Chargers get their act together once, you know, they get their coach staff and, and, and assuming Herbert is healthy. And I do think the Raiders sweep the Denver Broncos. Well, any given Sunday, I just, I see the Broncos as a rebuilding squad. Uh, Bo Nix is probably going to start. Cortland Sutton looking for a new contract. Who knows? Maybe they trade Cort Cortland Sutton before the season starts. If they do, I, I see the Broncos as a 4-5 win team. What I don't understand is I don't see how a lot of outlets have the Raiders finishing last in the AFC West. Again, I don't, I'm not, I don't think the Raiders are a bad football team. My expectations are just a little lower than the average fan. So I don't. I think the Raiders are going to be stuck in this middle ground until they find their franchise quarterback. But I don't see how the Raiders finished last in their division. I think that's going to be reserved for the Denver Broncos. And I think the Raiders and the Chargers would be in the middle, somewhere between eight and nine wins, both teams. And then, that, of course, the Chiefs winning the division as they look for their three-peat. So I'm not overly down on the Raiders. I just think they're going to be a middling team somewhere between 
you know, seven to nine wins. I don't see the double digit thing happening unless, you know, as, as we said, injuries do happen. If they have some mm -hmm. back quarterbacks, they play at the end of the year, you know, one or two games always surprise you because we have a longer season. So upsets do happen. Two games that I, I mentioned earlier in, the, in this show that could go either way. The Falcons and the Buccaneers games to me are critical. And I said, don't sleep on those two teams, but I can also see the Raiders winning those games as well. So if the Raiders win those two games against the against the Buccaneers and Falcons, that would mean for my projections, the Raiders would sweep the NFC South because I have them beating the Panthers and I have them beating the Saints. If they beat the Buccaneers and the Falcons, then that's a 10-win season. And yeah, if they have exactly. a 10-win season, hooray, great for us, great for everyone, great for Raider Nation. But those two games are the games that I think can go either way, though I will tell fans again, don't sleep on the Bucks and the Falcons. Correct, and and that's where that's where I say the ten ceiling because I, I could see that happening. Um, and the only other thing we don't know, and again, you got to go with what you have, which is available data, and and recency, is if Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Minshew have a crazy year, like we saw at a Baker Mayfield last year, right? Some something like that, which is unexpected. They perform above, at, far above expectations. Then I could also see that factoring in where the Raiders could win 10 games there. Uh, so we'll have to see. And we'll see what they do with the rest of um, this period between now and camp as far as adding people. But it's tough, you know, and 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 everybody's aiming for the Chiefs. And all you got to do is look at them and say, OK, are they as good? Well, yes, the Raiders beat them on Christmas Day. No question. Great win. But they've won two games out of 10 in Kansas City, right, over the last 10 games. They're two and eight. So um, now, hopefully this year they make it three and eight, right? You never know, but it's going to be tough. So we'll see. But we'll keep talking about this, and we'll give our preseason prediction later in the year. All right, we're going to take a break now. We come back, we're going to get through some callers here with the minutes we have left um, on Silver and Black today. So we'll get to your calls. Uh, we got a bunch of them. That's why we're doing them on two days now. So if you didn't hear your call today, you might hear it on Tuesday, vice versa. Or call us, tell us what you think uh, as far as the schedule goes. You're with Scott. This is uh, Silver and Black today with Mo Moten. We're coming back right after these messages. Welcome back. Time for the home stretch here on Silver and Black today, the Thursday edition. Yeah, it's a, to you a little bit late, but we wanted to wanted to get some sleep. Mo and I had a late night with the schedule release last night, and but we wanted to get you a new show today to talk about that schedule. So you heard Mo's prediction, eight and nine. We'll see if that stays where it's at. He was consistent last year and right on the money. I was thinking, I think I was a game off and you were right on, right? You had eight wins. I had, I had seven and 10. So. Seven and 10. That's right. So you were close. So I, was, I, was I had close. eight. Wow. I was right. I was, I, I beat you once. Oh my gosh. It's crazy. <laughs> and I'm always the one that's pointed out as being the negative one. Okay. No, I'm kidding. Um, all right. So we're going to get into our phone calls for the week now. Or I should say for Thursday. We did calls on Tuesday too. Good feedback from you guys on that one. So we're going to get into these calls as well. And if you want to be a part of the show on Tuesday, if you if we get enough calls, we'll do them again. 702-900-7869. 702-900-7869. I particularly want to know how you feel about most predictions. Let me know what you think of the eight and I nine already, prediction. I can already tell you what the, what the response <laughs> to that is. Going to be. We have good listeners. I mean, they they're they're even when they disagree with us, they're respectful about it. But they're also, I think, most of them are realistic. We have some really kind of glass half full guys out there, and that's cool. Nothing wrong with that. I rather live my life in a little bit of that than being completely negative all the time because we do have some fans like that. We appreciate them listening too, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, I don't think they'll ever think the Raiders will win anything ever again. So I get it. But all right, let's get into the calls. First, we're going to Anders from Oakland. Longtime listener and caller. Here is Anders in Oakland. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, this is Anders from Oakland. Um, here we go. McDaniel, what? Gunther, Downing, Ziegler, Mayock, Leatherwood, Arnett, Bowden Jr., Farrell. Abram, Paul, Parker, Conley, Joseph. It hasn't been easy for a dad. I've been trying to be an exemplary <laughs> father to my son, putting a positive spin on our draft <laughs> and hires to him, offering emotional support, being there for him through the tears, year after year after year. And here comes 2024. I don't have to say Jack. 
I'm just twiddling my thumbs, sitting around, goofing off. So the only thing he is even remotely worried about is Getsy. Anything on this guy's resume I can reference to help put his positive spin on him? Thanks, guys. Be good. All right, Anders, thanks for your call, man, and uh, shout out to your son as well. And everybody always forgets the war daddy. They forget Tanner Muse oh, when you leave that list. I'm here to anyway. remind everybody, especially those of you who would yell and scream at me how wrong I was going to be about Tanner Muse. Okay, so I got that going for me. Uh, <laughs> Anders, uh, we, if you listen to the show the last couple of weeks, we're just as concerned. We're looking for the positive of Luke Getzey, right? Comes in. Uh, the positive I'll give him is he passed the Antonio Pierce test and the Raiders test with how they're building their culture. But again, Mo, this is the biggest question along with quarterback going into the season. Anders, I have a positive for you. DJ Moore at wide receiver, Cole Komet at tight end, both mm -hmm. put up career numbers last year under Luke Getze. I think mm -hmm. Luke Getze works well with the pass catchers he has with tight end and wide receiver. Devontae Adams stood by him. Uh, as I said, career numbers for both DJ Moore and Cole Komet last year, though the Bears had a backup quarterback in Tyson Bajit playing for a portion of the season because Justin Fields was hurt. Uh, I know a lot of people listen to our show say, oh, Justin Fields sucks. It wasn't all Luke Getty's <laughs> fault. If you want to say that, fine. Um, as I said, even with the quarterback situation, DJ Moore, Cole Komet, career years, right? as far as receiving numbers are concerned. So if you translate that to the Raiders, I think Brock Bowers is going to have a strong year. I think Michael Mayer will be pretty good. I think the wide receivers will do, will do well. The question will be consistency. So the Bears, so while DJ Moore and Cole Komet had, had big numbers, the Bears didn't have much consistency on offense. They had Justin Fields and Tyson Bajor playing. Those guys pretty much backups this year, this season, right? So even with backup-level quarterbacks – Luke Getz, he got some production out of his pass, out of his primary pass catchers. So again, if you translate that to the Raiders, you would think Devontae Adams, Brock Bowers, even Michael Mayer, Jacoby Myers, two of those, two of those four guys should have a pretty decent season. So if you're looking for the positive, you're looking for the golden nugget, that is it. There you go. Appreciate the call, honors as always. Now we're going out to uh Oroville, California, and John. Which right near Oroville is two towns I love. There's there's two little towns. One's called Palermo, like in Sicily, which is where my great grandfather came from, and the other one is called Dingerville. And I'm just I just think of Dingerville being full of power hitters. Anyway, let's go to John in Oroville. Here he is. Hi, Scott and Mo. It's John from Lake Oroville, California. Just calling about the Raiders roster and moving into the 2024 season. Pretty excited about things. I know there's been some grief that we didn't land a high-end quarterback, and God knows I wanted Penix, but one thing we could do to elevate that room would be to try and acquire Hendon Hooker, who is sitting on Detroit's sidelines just collecting dust. Uh, they just signed Goff to a long-term deal. This would be the perfect time to make a proposal to Detroit to land their backup quarterback, Hendon Hooker, who came out last year in the draft and is a lot like Michael Penix Jr. The guy would be fantastic to add to our quarterback room. I think we could offer a trade. We could offer Michael Mayer, or we could do something different in that respect, but we should try to acquire him. I think Detroit would love to have Mayer, and I think there's other options they could take, but I would make that move, and I think it was smart that we waited – through free agency to add a bunch of pieces, waiting for the quality players that we were looking for to add to the roster. I think that was smart rather than load a bunch of quantity over quality. Um, it's better to just wait it out and pick up the right guys. People will be cutting down to the 53-man roster this summer, and there's going to be some other options popping up if we've got a spot or two available. So keep that in mind also. That's all I got. Let's go, Raiders! <laughs> All right, John and Lake Oroville up there near the dam. There's the Oroville Dam, for those of you up in California. Uh, good call. A couple things, Mo. Number one, Hendon Hooker last year was still rehabbing a knee injury, so didn't see the field at all. So really, this is his rookie year, if you think about it, right? He's going to actually get out there, play in camp. His knee looks good. Um, and yes, they did sign Goff to that contract, 
with a potential out in 2028, um, and they're giving him a ton of cash up front. They're giving him 80 million of the 100 and what is it, 70 guaranteed. So they're giving him basically half his money this year in cash. So yes, those are big cap numbers, but if you look at it, Mo, after 2026, the dead cap hit, yeah, it's still high at 29 million. But um, I think that the Reliance, everything that I've read and, and been a part of and seen what the Lions are doing is they they want to see what Hendon Hooker is this year to see if that's the guy who's going to succeed Jared Goff. So I don't see them trading him. And I also think the risk for the Raiders to trade for him this year would be too high because he's coming back from the knee. We just don't know what he's going to do. You're right about that. I, I will say, though, that with the extension for Goff and assuming – you know, golf comes out and I mean, he's barely going to see the field during the offseason because of the with leading the Lions to the NFC championship game. I don't see why they would have any doubts about him. I actually do see a scenario in which the Lions would offer up Hendon Hooker. I, and I don't mm. even think I know the caller said that you can offer Michael Mayer. I wouldn't even offer that much. Hendon Hooker, as you said, hasn't he's played a snap pick. yet. He hasn't played a snap yet and he's coming off of a significant injury. I think a middle round draft pick would be enough to to get acquire Hendon Hooker if the Lions are putting him on the trade block and making him available. Not putting him on the trade block, but if the Lions are willing to listen to offers for Hendon Hooker, I think he can get it done with a middle round pick. I would even toss in Marcus Epps if Trey Taylor, a lot of people like Trey Taylor in this mm -hmm. year's draft for the Raiders, if he shows up and looks like a, a potential starter, or if Chris Smith the second in his second year looks like a potential starter. Offer up Marcus Epps uh, because the Lions do have a weakness in their linebacker court. I know what you're saying. Marcus Epps is a safety. But if you have a safety that can play in the box, that can compensate for, you know, a weak linebacker court. The Lions, they need some coverage in the middle of their field in the intermediate zones. Marcus Epps could possibly fill that role for them. I would offer a middle round pick or Marcus Epps if Trey Taylor or one of their young safeties, Isaiah Polo Mile, Chris Smith, the second step up and look like a starter, you can offer up maybe Epps or a middle round pick if you're looking at a Hendon Hooker and acquiring him. Yeah, and the, the 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 Lions do not have a good quarterback roster. You get past Hooker and you have Nate Sudfield, of course, a journeyman from Indiana, has been in the league for I think seven or eight years. So so they they don't have a lot of options at quarterback. They had Hooker and Goff before after Teddy Bridgewater retired remember after this past year so so they're in a situation but um yeah i mean i i credit i credit john for looking for options for the raiders at quarterback all right we go on now to raider ray staying back in california here's raider ray hey what's up scott and mo this is my name is raider ray calling out of stockton california uh first time caller long time listener i enjoy your guys' show it's very entertaining very fun um Great way to get some Raider news. Just had a question, or I was thinking about something. I think this upcoming season is going to be very important, and it's really going to be dependent on the coordinators. Uh, obviously, we're very uh, fortunate to have Patrick Graham as our defensive coordinator, but we have a lot of firepower on that offense now, <laughs> and I think it's all going to be determined on Mr. Luke Getze here. I'm really, you know uncertain what this guy brings to the table i mean they say he was all he was decent in green bay but he sure the hell wasn't decent in chicago <laughs> so you know here's hoping for him to do well because i'm a long time suffering raider fan man <laughs> i would like to see things turn around but anyways go raider nation and thanks a lot all right there's ray out in stockton california ray thanks man and, and we appreciate uh, the compliments on the show, the work Mo and I put in. So thank you for that. And and it's, again, the reason why we love our listeners. And you guys are always right in the ballpark. You know, we don't always agree, but you're always in the ballpark. And I appreciate that. I see some of these other shows, uh, which will remain nameless because I'm not criticizing public, uh, other public people. But talking about trading for, you know, all these different guys, which is never going to happen, all that kind of stuff. I mean, look, if you're eight years old, I get it. But if you're if you're adults like us and think about it, uh, you want good conversation. So Mo, you think about what he said there it goes back to what we we're talking about. Luke Getzey, uh, and, and the quarterback though, he's, and, and it's not just blaming the quarterback if the quarterback doesn't well, it's Getzey's job too to not only come out with an offensive scheme that works and utilizes those 
those uh, skilled players that that Ray talked about, but also developing quarterbacks. Right. So if you, even if you look at Lugetsi in Chicago, when I look at the Bears situation, I don't blame that all on Lugetsi. I don't blame that all on Justin Fields. They both share blame there why that passing offense didn't take the leap that it should have or that the Bears expected it to take last season under his tutelage. Now, I think with Aiden O'Connell, Gardner Minshew, a little better of a quarterback room with the Raiders. But I share, Ray, I share your concerns, and I talked about it in the first two segments, that it's, it comes down to how well Luke Getsy can use those playmakers. You can have, you know, five or six quality playmakers, but if they're not put in position to make plays, you know, you're not going to score a lot of points. Right. You know, a lot of people would agree with me when I say that the Raiders' offense was better than what it was last year without Brock Bowers, you know, and they struggled to score points. Why was that? Because the play caller just didn't click with the playmakers that he had. And the and, and Tony Pierce had to come in and kind of change it up and go physical and run the football. We'll see what he does this year. Of course, he has to put the uh, onus on his offensive coordinator and his offensive coaching staff to get the most out of his playmakers. But, I, Ray, I share your concerns. We'll see what happens here. I'm not going to say Luke Getz is, the, is, is Josh McDaniels level play caller. But I will say he has a lot to prove. He does. and But let me add this, too, because I know we advocated for the Raiders possibly looking into acquiring Justin Fields because I, I think a lot of our listeners think that, that he's awful, which I don't believe because I think, to your point, Mo, it's a great, great point, which is situations, there's plenty of blame to go around. It's not just the quarterback. It's the coordinator. It's the head coach. It's the organization, how things are handled. So I'm not – telling you Justin Fields is going to be an all pro. I'm just saying this. But if you look at the numbers last year, Aiden O'Connell and Justin Fields, uh, 64, 61% completion rating, 2,500 yards, 16 touchdowns, nine interceptions, 86.3 quarterback rating. That's Justin Fields. Now I know what you're saying. It's, it was, it was his third year. Okay. But still that's where he was at. Aiden O'Connell, 62%. So a little better from completion percentage, 2,200 yards, 12 touchdowns, seven interceptions for a rating of 83.9. So if you look at Justin Fields last year and Aiden O'Connell last year, again, I know he's a rookie, but the performance of the quarterbacks was somewhat similar. Different circumstances, I get it. But that's what I'm saying is that it, you can't just blame the quarterback in Chicago last year. So that's why I think Mo and I both feel that, you know, if you're in Las Vegas, especially uh, Luke Getzey's running around with Sunrise Mountain on his back. It's a big mountain in, <laughs> in Las Vegas because he's got a lot of pressure. He's going to have to show it. And I think I do think the difference between eight, ten wins and six, seven wins is going to be what he's able to do with that. So Raider Ray, great call, man. We appreciate it. And we're sorry you're long suffering like a lot of Raider fans. <laughs> Hopefully that comes to an end. All right, staying in California again. We've got a big California contingent on the calls this week. It is Lonnie from Fontana, California. Here's Lonnie. Good morning, gentlemen. Lonnie from Fontana, California. Um, so I was just listening to the latest episode regarding the uh, coin flip gate. And, uh, <laughs> you know, again, as a longtime Raider fan, I always got to chuckle at how those things get completely twisted and you know hate to always sound like that same raider fan banging the same drum but you know again with the media it's always something for raider nation to have to deal with and cringe and kind of get through but with that same sort of thing uh you know you guys were discussing brock bowers in that episode and how he was you know on a lot of you know a lot of pundits boards um the number two ranked prospect in the entire draft. And I'd seen recently a few different articles drop. Won't mention any of the particular outlets, but talking about offensive rookie of the year uh, odds. And I don't think I saw Brock Bowers on any of them. And I just find that kind of, I'm kind of curious to get your take on that. Um, I don't quite understand how he could be the number two ranked prospect and i see marvin harrison jr and a bunch of other guys odunze and uh, of course a couple of the quarterbacks up there but not even a mention of brock bowers and so just curious to know what you guys think about that i you know obviously you can take into account the quarterback situation we got the 
maybe the somewhat lackluster excitement of the offensive coordinator and not sure what gets he's going to bring to the table just yet. Um, but anyway, just curious again to hear what you guys think about that. And uh, I appreciate again, your show as always, there is only one place I turn to, to get uh, what I feel is probably the most unbiased hmm. uh, kind of middle of the road, if you will, Raider uh, opinions. And that's, from both you guys. I really appreciate the work you guys put into the show um, individually and collectively. Thank you guys very much. Bye. All right. There's Lonnie and Fontana and one of these for him, Mo. Yeah, definitely. Unbiased, middle of the road. Like, it, I mean, it gives me goosebumps because that's what we try to do. Now, again, that's not criticizing the fan shows and everything who are the other way. There's there's there, people like that and nothing wrong with it. But we strive for that. So amazing to hear that from you, Lonnie. Thank you very, very much. And I sincerely, sincerely mean that. Sincerely mean that after the week this week, like I said, I, I'm not going to get on my soapbox here, but <laughs> the hardest thing to do is to do a show where you have to tell fans and explain to fans why you think their team isn't going to have a winning record. And I had to do that on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And it's not something I enjoy. I know some some content creators love to have shock value and to say things that are extreme one way or another to get clicks and views. That's not what I do. I, I Anything that I say on these airwaves to you Raider fans out there is because I actually believe in it and I've done the research on it. I'm not saying I'm always right, but it's going to be well-researched. And I appreciate Lonnie for saying that simply because I pride myself on being objective. That's how I grew up covering sports. Going to St. John's, that's how I was taught how to cover the sports. Not to wave the pom-poms, but to make observations and give the people what you see through your lens and be honest and authentic. I'm never going to sell you a narrative that I think sounds good to get you to listen to the show. I'm going to tell you exactly what I think. So I really appreciate Lonnie for that comment. Yeah. And um, same for me, Mo. We talk, you and I talk about this off the air all the time. Right. And again, we're not, we don't, we're not critical of other people, but we were, we were taught a certain way when it became, when it came to reporting, whether, you know, Mo grew up a Raiders fan, right? He grew up a Raiders fan. I did right. not. I grew up a Charger fan, as you guys know, and, and you like to razz me about all the time. <laughs> but when I come on this show, it's easier for me because I gave up on them 10 years ago when they were going to move and just didn't, as a fan, didn't want to do it. Plus, I wanted to get back into the business after a corporate career. So for me and Mo both, we always look at it. We talk off the air sometimes about the state of journalism and entertainment, right? And so my college professor, Mary Hausch at UNLV in Las Vegas, and she's still a very dear friend of mine. So shout out to Mary. Um, same thing was always about you can't let your personal feelings or biases come into it. And so that's why you guys give me crap every once in a while. I'll wear a Raiders hat and you're like, oh my God, you're wearing a Raiders hat. Because it, it's, it, and my kids gave it to me for a Father's Day gift. And so I wear it, but I don't wear it that often because I'm, it makes me feel a little like, nah, I'm trying to give you guys my opinion. I don't want it to be biased. I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to have a heart or a this or that get in the way of things. So Lonnie, I know we got it on the side there, but thank you very much. On the rookie of the year odds, I look at it, Mo, and I think there's a pretty easy answer to this one, and that is yep. um, he's on the list. He's at plus 4,000 <laughs> behind Lad McConkey of the Chargers and just Jesus. ahead of Ricky Paris. I know. Um, but it's not surprising because, remember, this is betting now, though. So I understand what he's saying, but – the betting is different. Remember that. This is about money, not about necessarily the player. You have out of the top 10 people, it's all wide receivers and quarterbacks. It's quarterbacks, the young guys, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy, Drake May. And then the rest of the guys are wide receivers playing with those quarterbacks or established top-tier quarterbacks. So Correct. from an odds-making perspective, um, Lonnie, that's why, because they know, hey, if you're going to play with Josh Allen, guess what? You're probably going to get a lot of balls. Um, same thing with Adunzia. He's at 2,500 plus 2,500. But the top four favorites, McCarthy plus 1,000, Jaden Daniels plus 900, Harrison plus 600, and Kalen Williams at plus 210, which I think is ridiculous. I don't think Caleb Williams will be the rookie of the year. Just saying. Um, Marvin Harrison has a good quarterback if he stays healthy. Jaden Daniels, Washington's a pretty good team, man. I, they're look, people are looking past them. So again, I know your your Raider flag flies high, um, but I wouldn't let that deter you because a rookie of the year tight end. Well, who's the last rookie of the year who won tight end? That tight end. I don't think there has been. 
I can't remember well. Can you? I'm going to look it up while you answer me. I have to look it up. But I, I'll get to Lonnie's question in the meantime. Yeah. I will say this. There are two things here at play. You mentioned it. Established quarterback. So Marvin Harrison Jr. to me is one of the front runners because he's got Kyler Murray, who was a Pro Bowl quarterback at one point. As long as he stays healthy, you assume in with Kyler Murray, Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to put up numbers. Roma Dunze in Chicago, yes, he has a rookie quarterback, but Caleb Williams was the number one overall pick, and a lot of people expect him to be in a running for offensive rookie of the year. We all know how these offensive play of the year, offensive rookie of the year awards go. They favor the quarterback position. So you have to expect quarterbacks to be at the top of the list and Marvin Harrison Jr. with the quarterback he has to be at the top of the list. The other factor here is Brock Bowers, while he is a versatile playmaker, he will be splitting snaps at tight end with Michael Mayer. So he's he may not have a full workload as a rookie. Now, I know you can move Michael Mayer and Brock Bowers around the formation, but he is essentially going to be splitting snaps at times at tight end with Michael Mayer because they're not always going to be on the field at the same time. We talked about the Rays running a lot of 12 personnel. They'll run other personnel groupings as well where one or the other will be on the field. So you also have to factor in his workload may not be as robust as some of the other rookies on that list. Absolutely. 702-900-7869 if you want to get on the show for Tuesday. 702-900-7869. Name, where you're calling from. Keep it. Try to keep it under two minutes. Uh, by the way, no tight end or offensive lineman has ever won NFL Offensive Rookie of the Year. So there you go. There you go. That's part of the reason the odds are so high. Uh, Lonnie, hope there that you helps you, man. Appreciate the call as well. All right, here's our last call. Hey, Scott. Hey, Mo. Um, you know, I love the show. Um, you guys get me going, you know, during during the soft season. So I'm happy you guys are doing your thing. Um, I just wanted to bring up a couple of things. Um, um, it's kind of interesting that we're, we're picking up uh, wide receivers. So, um, you know, we picked up um, Gallup and um, the other guy from the Chargers. I'm just wondering if there's like a – you know, if the third wide receiver is up in the air, because I have a feeling the third wide receiver and Jacoby Myers are going to probably have a really big, really big um, season because they're going to double cover Devontae. Devontae gets a lot of the attention. And, of course, um, our quarterback is not really aggressive that much. He's um, that we have Aiden. He's not really aggressive enough where he can make plays and move and be mobile. So I have a feeling he's going to just go for his first read. So it might just be, um, you know, the second option of the tight end or, or the receiver. But I have a feeling that um, – we might pick up a receiver, maybe a, a, an experienced wide receiver, maybe during cutdowns, because depending on what we see with uh, with Trey Tucker and them, they don't have a lot of experience. So, and I think maybe some experience will help the quarterback, you know, um, some, with, through his development. You know, also um, with um, the um, off the off season, um, you know, I, I really would have liked seeing um, I really would have liked seeing the Raiders pick up, um, you know, a more experienced quarterback like. Kirk Cousins. I would have actually considered Kirk Cousins going to us and um, our defensive linemen that we picked up, them going to the Falcons, and maybe we would have picked up a prospect, a higher prospect, and they wouldn't have drafted um, their quarterback, the Falcons, that they drafted uh, this season. But that's all water to the bridge. I just, I just how I felt about things. And then also, um, lastly, when it comes to um, um, this season, um, it's, it's, it's going to, you know, I think we're going to, I think we also need to add a little bit more depth on the receiver, uh, running back too, as well. But, uh, but for the most part, um, and also one thing I thought too was I have a feeling that um, maybe the maybe the Russell Wilson might get cut from from uh, the Steelers like after after camp and preseason. He's not gonna like being being a backup, but I have a feeling he might get cut. I have a feeling Justin Fields gonna feel, but he has more upside. He's younger, and you never know if he could pick up another quarterback before the season starts if we don't like what we see with our quarterbacks. That's all I got. Um, yeah, thank you for your time. Uh, look forward to hearing from you guys. All right. Great call, uh, listener. Appreciate it. You did not leave your name, so I would give you names. So if just message us here on YouTube or on x.com, let us know who you were. But great call. I'm going to start with the back end. Mo, was there, was there any – I know it wasn't going to happen and they didn't go this direction. There was other needs. But um, – if the Raiders had decided to go after a Kirk Cousin this year, you know, you predicted eight wins for them this year. Now that included their first round draft pick and all this other stuff that they had. Um, if if the Raiders would have done that instead of looking for a young quarterback or looking for a stopgap, um, would that made have, would that have made any difference? And in any world, could you have seen that happening? 
It would definitely would make a difference. Kirk Cousins is an upgrade right now over what the Raiders have at quarterback. So if the Raiders have Kirk Cousins, then I would say, yeah, the Raiders could win double digit games. I think the I've said this before, and I know a lot of fans are gonna say I, I'm negative on the Raiders because my prediction doesn't match their prediction. But I think I honestly think the Raiders are quarterback away from being perennial playoff contenders. I know that's gonna make some people chuckle on the negative side, but I think they are with a with a Kirk Cousins, they win 10, 11 games, in my opinion. Unfortunately, they didn't, you know, I don't know what their interest was in Kirk Cousins. Of course, Devontae Adams, I believe, had a quote saying that he he would like to play with Kirk Cousins or Kirk Cousins is a pretty good quarterback. I agree with him. Before Kirk Cousins tore his Achilles, he was praying, he was playing at a Pro Bowl level. The last time Kirk Cousins played a full season, the Minnesota Vikings were 13 and 4. Think about that. So yeah. I think the Rays could have easily won double digit games if they had gone after and landed a Kirk Cousins. One comment I want to make on on the caller's thoughts about the wide receiver position. I'm a little worried about Trey Tucker. I know he gives the Raiders speed out of the slot position, but as the caller pointed out, the Raiders are picking up these wide receivers, and they're, these are not scrub wide receivers. Michael no. Gallup had over 1,100 yards with the Cowboys in one year, uh, and, and Jalen Guyton is a former Chargers guy, so Tom Telesco has a familiarity with him. I'm a little worried about Trey Tucker's role in this offense, and again, when if assuming that Luke Getzey is creative and lines up Brock Bowers in the slot, that also takes snaps away from Trey Tucker, who lines up almost exclusively in a slot. So with the influx of wide receivers they're bringing in, with, with Brock Bowers possibly lining up in the slot, I am worried about Trey Tucker. Not that he gets cut, but I feel like they may not fully utilize him to his best abilities, to his highest potential, even though we saw flashes from him last season under the former coaching staff. Yeah, and on the quarterback thing too, you know, they could do that next year, but remember – the the class the, the free agent class next year i'm not even talking about the draft dak prescott is the jewel of the class so take that for what it's worth then you have two tag of tag of viola bleh, excuse me too early in the morning um jordan love who i expect to be signed by the packers Take and of course out. jared goff was in that class too but he just got signed too so you're talking about two of jordan love and dak prescott with dak with jordan love to me probably going to be off the market I, I would imagine they'll re-sign him or assign him to an extension um, in camp. So we'll see what happens there. But great call. We appreciate it, man. Make sure you give us your name. Want to make sure we give you all the credit in the world uh, for your call. So thank you for that very much. All right. Well, that's going to wrap up the show. Mo, before we leave, uh, we're here on a Thursday. Anything going on for you the rest of the week that you need people to know? I know you got a brand new piece coming out on uh, Sports Knot uh, about the schedule. So why don't you lay it on us? Right, so I have a sports night piece coming out on the Raiders win loss projections. I'll explain in depth on why I have the Raiders going eight and nine. I know some fans are probably not going to read it because they don't want to hear about the Raiders going eight and nine. But if you're <laughs> interested in, you know, my full reasoning for me fleshing it out on on the screen, uh, it'll be out on Sports Night, and I'll go through game by game uh, where the Raiders win, where the Raiders lose. Even though I kind of told you where I was in the ballpark with the schedule with the hardest part of the schedule being in the middle from week six to 15 and the easier part of the schedule uh, being in the first five weeks. So I'll have that out on sports night on Friday. All right. And by the way, make sure in the description below on YouTube and in the description of the podcast, so wherever you get the podcast, most of you get it on Apple. Remember subscribe wherever you get your audio, please. We appreciate that uh, is a listing of the latest pieces by Mo and by me there so you can uh click through so if we're talking about an article here you can click right there and find it so we're trying to make it easy for you to find both his work on bleacher report and our work on sports not surrounding the raiders so make sure you do that all right we are going to be back next week and we will talk more raiders football mo have a great weekend my friend sounds good you too and listen thank you to everybody for calling in and for being part of the show we appreciate you guys as always, without you, it doesn't exist. We also wouldn't exist without our great producer, Mike Robier from Odyssey Sports, who helps us out with the show. So thanks to him. For Mo Moat, and I'm Scott Colbrands, and this has been Silver and Black today. Have a great weekend, Raider Nation. We'll talk to you next week.